podcast from Peach 2020, hosted by Peter Martin. Hello, I'm Peter Martin, co-founder of Peach 2020, the international network for senior executives, entrepreneurs, and influencers from across the hospitality sector. Welcome to the latest in our series of Top Table podcasts, which sees me in conversation with some of the biggest names in the out-of-home food and drink business, the real movers and shakers, picking up on the issues shaping the future of our industry. Now, my guest today is Thomasina Myers, the MasterChef winner and co-founder of Oaxaca, the Mexican fresh food restaurant brand. Now, I caught up with her in front of a live audience on stage at this year's casual dining show, where our conversations soon turned to one of her real passions, sustainability, how Oaxaca became a carbon neutral restaurant group to putting carbon impact labels on its menus with a mission to do their bit for the planet. So it's perhaps not surprising that Oaxaca has just won the acclaim of their fellow operators by winning the first sustainability award at the Peach Hero and Icon Awards. Here's Thomasina Myers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, another interview session here at uh, Casual Dining Show. And as you can tell, the, uh, the sound works all right. Um, I'm Peter Martin. It's my great pleasure to introduce my, um, my guest today, Thomasina or Tommy Myers, um, woman extraordinaire, really, um, re- founder of Oaxaca, but also author and, and all-round food evangelist. Tommy, I... S- I suppose the first question is, you know, obviously you were creator of uh, Oaxaca. It, it, it was your inspiration, but, but obviously you do a lot of other things. How, how does Oaxaca sort of fit into your day-to-day routine or week-to-week routine? Um, well, what, what's great about Oaxaca is that it, um, the way we set it up on the sustainability front um, has really helped shape everything else I do, right. I guess. Yeah. So my interests before Oaxaca, when I went to Bali Malu, the cooking school in Ireland, yeah, yeah. Um, and really learned about, you know, where does food come from? How's it grown? How does our production of food and selling it on and consuming of it yeah. affect the, the environment? So about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions are caused by food production. And so that interest in in how we eat and how we feed the planet, not only, you know, in a kind of environmental way, but, you know, in a healthy way so yeah. that we're, the human beings are thriving as well. Um, that that fitted into how we set up Oaxaca and that whole sustainability ethos that we set up with. And then it continues to feed everything I do. Yeah. So it's a really, it's a really nice, um, I did some radio uh, yesterday or the day before talking about where, where food comes from and sustainability and it, and it's really nice that Oaxaca is part of the story yeah because even though I've slightly stepped back from the business um you know half our menu is vegetarian we, pl- we play around with plant-based meat but I think it's really important for everyone who's on this sustainability journey no matter what stage they are in a food business whether it's takeaway or or, yeah. or eat in is to really look carefully at the whole environmental question because there are so many quick fixes and there are so many gimmicks. It's like, great, let's just offset some carbon tokens or let's just plant some trees. But unless you actually ask the right questions, like, well, what type of trees are you planting? Are you planting a monocrop, yeah. which will create an eco desert in some bit of land, wherever they're planting it. What's the cost of those tokens? Because the cost of those carbon tokens has gone like this since we started carbon offsetting yeah, yeah. seven years ago. Um, the plant-based food, how's it grown? You know, are those soy crops, which makes the plant-based food, still sprayed with insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, which is killing all species Indeed. and also soil? So I really, I think what we love to do at Oaxaca is get into the detail and the nitty-gritty of environmentalism, because otherwise I feel it's so easy to think you're doing the right thing. Um, but actually it's quite a complex subject. And I think we're all quite um, susceptible to carbon tunnel vision um, around the world at the moment without looking at things like soil, which for me is a more scary thing. Like global warming is here. Look at the floods in Pakistan. 
but 95% of the food we eat is grown in soil. Yeah, and it's the health of the soil itself. And half our soil is already degraded. Yeah. And we're degrading it at a football pitch every five minutes around the world. So, you know, if unless we start farming with nature and putting back into the soil, it feels like we might go the way of the Mayans who died out over 60 years. Well, well, it's a nice link back to Mexico there as well. So, you know, (laughs) nice one. Uh, But actually, if you're old like me, you wake up early, sort of quarter to to six every morning. I listen to farming today and I do recommend it even if it's on iPlayer. Because actually, that's a lot of the issues of the farming community, particularly about about soil health. Let's go back to those that day. I mean, you you talked about your time at Ballymaloo. So, I mean, the point is, everyone thinks sustainability is an issue now, but it's been going on for a long while. It's been building for people like you. So... How, you know, how long, how long have you been an advocate for sustainability? I mean, I think actually when I was at school, I worried about the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. Because that's what we learned, that we were cutting down the trees. Yeah. That was like 40 years ago. So, and I, it's, I think it's amazing as, as a species, the way we know problems, but how slow we are to fix it. Yeah. And part of the problem is, you know, how our politics, is, I mean, Let's just look at our political system in this country. Yeah. Unlike Singapore, you become education minister with no background in education. You become environmental minister with no background in environmentalism. And then you get changed like every year, every two years. And there's no knowledge. There's no kind of expertise there. Yeah. So I think it's, it's even if there was a political will to change things for the better, where's that knowledge base coming from in the government? You know, I, I spoke to an MP the other day about supporting the farmers to go yeah. on this regenerative route. He, he basically knew nothing about... So MPs are generalists, like GPs. Yeah. So it's very hard for them to go down into the detail because they have to be on top of a huge amount Indeed, of subjects. Yeah. But even even the schools ministers, the you know, prison ministers, the environmental ministers, the farming ministers, they've got no background. They've got no expertise. So how can we hope yeah. them to help fix the system when every couple of years we get a new one and he's got no expertise either? So I think... I am a great advocate of business doing the right thing because I feel we are much more nimble. Yeah. We're much better equipped to gather expertise because we don't set up businesses and then sell them an off the year. We, you know, when we start well, businesses, we were do, but not many. Well, a few people, <laughs> but we're in it for the long haul, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, so I feel like we've got more. We need to obviously lobby and yeah. we try and get legislation behind so us. So, in, in a sense, what you're saying is the restaurant, the pub market, because and in fact, we are closer to the consumer because you know you're. you're, you're feeding them, uh, um, interacting with them every day. So that's a real, real, real job to be done. And we can, we can lead that. I mean, it's hard, right? Of course. It's a job to be done. And we're sitting here in like the worst crisis yeah. since COVID. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, What's we, next we year? We came right? out of COVID <laughs> yeah. thinking, yeah. you know, wow, maybe we can recoup some of this damage. Yeah. And now we're in this kind of combined ingredient price hike and energy utilities. So I think it's 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 incredibly hard for our entire sector. Yeah. But at the same time, um, I was talking to Kerry Foods um, last week, and they did a big piece of consumer research. Yeah. And all consumers now expect the places they go out and eat in to be thinking about sustainability, to talk about it, to show them what they're doing. So I feel like it's not an optional luxury anymore. Yeah. Because your consumer does expect it, even if they're still price sensitive and even if they still want it to taste delicious because they definitely want it to taste delicious and they are price sensitive but there is definitely market research to show that they are prepared to pay a bit more for the like the greener choice if you can show them uh, absolutely if you can show them why they're paying a bit well i think i presented something similar about this time yesterday actually but actually people you know people buy into the green agenda and also the you know premium agenda as well that people want quality quality is almost uh, it's a, it, it's a, a component of value. Yes. So that that's an important thing. So, but going but going back to that point you made about Kerry Foods, I think again there is an interesting point. I think there's a quote. I'm trying to remember who made it, but it's, it, it's it's a great quote that actually your supply chain is basically a source of free consultancy, and perhaps there's sometimes perhaps a sense in the restaurant sector that operators don't talk to suppliers a lot because there's actually quite a lot of awful lot of expertise there i mean you know you're talking about curry foods i mean do you find that a- across the board yeah definitely there's a huge amount of expertise and actually um you know in weight of our lovely queen um passing away and her soft power i think we have tremendous amount of soft power um just by asking the right questions of our suppliers yeah so you know all these plant-based meats 
I always say, well, how, how, how do you grow your product? Yeah. Because I'm interested to know how much it's sprayed. Because frankly, I'm looking at now suppliers who are moving away from herbicide, pesticide, fungicide, and trying to get to a more in, you know, with nature, nature friendly farming system. So I think asking those questions shows that people are thinking about that. Because, I mean, I was reading a piece in an, the American press on the way here. The plant based food business will has the potential to be $3 trillion um, over the next kind of 10 years or so, and to be controlled by very few players. And it's all patented. So we're looking at a future where a small amount of people have complete control of our food supply system if we don't, if we're not careful and if we're not asking the right questions. Because if we're not asking the right questions, those people who are still profit driven and often, you know, if you take Cargill's, maybe I shouldn't say a name, if you take some of the large industrial meatpacking yeah, no, yeah. um, yeah. companies in America, they are now jumping onto the plant based bandwagon. They've got no background of caring about the environment. So the idea that just switching from our beef burger to plant based burger, yes, it's more efficient for land use, but are they actually still extracting from yeah. the. Look, and, yeah. yeah. Because also, I mean, we are seeing in UK, you have a lot of sort of state chains like like Oxmoor and M restaurants are actually going a long, long way down down the environmental route. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are so many like Hodma Dodds is one of my favourite companies that do. They work with a massive cooperative of uh, organic regenerative farmers who are growing lentils, legumes, chickpeas, oats, barley, like food that we used to eat what much much more of three yeah. or four hundred years ago and i think that we we confuse i think it's really easy to be told by the media and, and let's you know let's just have a little bit of um i think little bit of cynicism about um you know who funds a lot of our media outlets and all sorts of things but but you know who the the, the stories we're told about the way we can eat i mean if we just go back 80 years to how our grandparents ate. That's yeah. way more sustainable. You know, a bit less meat, lots more fruit and vegetables. Chefs and Schools is this fantastic charity uh, I helped set yeah. up where we feed kids really, really good, delicious food at a lesser food cost than the yeah. big industrialized ca caterers. But there's always that saying, isn't it? You know, don't eat any food that your grandmother wouldn't recognize. Yes, <laughs> That's exactly. probably not a, not and, a good And it's interesting, a lot of these futuristic foods are ultra processed. Yeah, indeed. And we know that the ultra processed food industry is actually killing, you know, it's killing 65,000 people a year now in this country alone. Yeah. It's costing the UK 64 billion pounds a year, they think, just the way we eat. So we definitely need to change our diets, but it doesn't mean we, doesn't mean we have to ergo uh, just eat lots of different processed food. We could just like cook some more vegetables yeah. and cover them in delicious olive oil and butter and spices and make them delicious. Um, and Wild Farmed is another company like Hobma Dodds that is farming regeneratively. And, you know, I've been helping them a bit getting their word out to restaurants because, for instance, they're talking to M&S. So M&S are now putting a Wild Farmed loaf. Right, yeah. Through, you know, and if M&S, basically supermarket chain, sees the value of putting a flour that's grown in harmony with nature through into their bread, then it feels like the rest of us can follow suit. <laughs> Now, we're having a nice chat here. I hope, hope you're interested. Any questions for Tommy? So if you have, just put your hands up. Right, we'll start here, lady here, and then we'll come over here. Hey, yeah, um, I've got two questions, really. Um, the first one is, I've noticed with Oaxaca, you've got a lot of carbon footprinting on your menus now. Yeah. So I was just wondering, when you started that process, did that lead you to change your menu? And also, what was the sort of consumer reaction once you've put all of that information out there for them to sort of understand more about their food? And my second question is, when we talk about suppliers, so some suppliers are doing great things, some are very new on that journey, and when you look at biodiversity, water uh, consumption in those areas, how did you start the process working with suppliers that maybe this is all quite new to them, they're not quite sure about sustainability, they don't know where they are, but you want to bring them on that journey. How do you sort of start that process and tackle that? Um, so the first question, carbon, on our menu. Uh, so I think, um, to be honest, we're doing customer 
um, research at the moment to know what the impact was and what people think, think about it. So I think that data is actually coming through next week because I think I've got a radio interview next Tuesday with the BBC. And apparently I'm going to get some kind of intel about that. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, I, I know the people in government who were behind the calories on the menu. And I really believe they were trying to do the right thing. But for me, a calorie is such a red herring um, in terms of, even with, in terms of health, because our Hodma Dodds bean tostada, uh, I think is delicious. It gives you lots of fiber, lots of micronutrients. Uh, but the tostada is deep fried and it's got some fat in it. Fat's not a bad thing and it's got calories. So compare that calories to say, I don't know, like a my, um, frappuccino with extra caramel syrup. You know, and they're complete different calories and they do different things to your body. So for me, a calorie is a red herring. And also we vilify calories. Like yeah. in the morning I get up and I need a calorie, calories to get me started so that I can bicycle to work and live a happy, fulfilled day without energy. We can't live. So for me, a calorie is a good thing. We should be eating calories in a mindful way, but not vilifying them. So I think going that whole calorie watching is completely wrong way to think about food. Food is, should be about pleasure and enjoyment and trying to eat better things and not format our diet to big companies that make money selling us crap. So, um, so carbon measuring on our menu was a way to push back on the calories because legally we had to comply with it. But it was a slightly like, well, we'll have to do it, but we don't believe a word, a word in it. So it's a slightly kind of renegade moment like that. But also because we've been on that carbon journey for seven years now, we kind of had all the data at our fingertips. I don't think it's... It, Putting the carbon on the menu for us didn't change our menus because we've, we've already been looking at carbon for seven years on all of our dishes just because we've been offsetting for seven years. Um, but I think it's a nice way to flag up to the yeah. consumer how they're eating and what they're eating. Again, carbon's not the full measure um, of, of the whole thing. So then getting back to your second question, uh, when you're talking about water, I mean, I think packaging is one massive way we it's can lobby government here. because... We work with an amazing packaging guy who has fully compostable packaging for our takeaway. But we still can't put that in our food compost bin because the government still make it legal for food packaging to put plastics in. So even those bioplastics, so for a while we were selling the bioplastic straw, straws, yeah, know, yeah. when the straw thing came in, there was a bioplastic you could use that you know, apparently broke down over time, but it's still into micro, micro, microplastics. Now, why are those allowed? They should be completely, all plastic should be banned from packaging. And then we could compost a lot. Because guess what? A perfect compost system yeah, yeah, yeah. has carbons and nitrogens. The carbons being the cardboard around the food packaging and the nitrogens being the actual food. So if you could compost a lot together, put the whole thing to compost and put it back on your land. So that would be a massive way we could, you know, harness the good of yeah. takeaways and what we're eating, put it straight back into the land. So there's no joined up thinking in government. But that's something, you know, the straw campaign was massive, but it was minuscule. You know, just talking about the straws, yeah. it makes me think, Jesus, if we could do that <laughs> yeah. with straws, yeah. let's put that behind plastic and packaging, because that would have a way, way far, more far reaching consequence for all land and soil. So let's get that as a new campaign, way more impact than, than straws. And then in terms of talking to your suppliers, every, you know, loads of people at different stages of this journey, including your suppliers, some are more reticent, but I really believe that almost everyone, even the dinosaurs, are beginning to realise they've got to make change. I mean, frankly, it's up to them to do their research, invest in consultants or, or whatever. But if you want to help them on their journey, you definitely can. And a lot of that is asking the right question. So how are you delivering? Um, what time are you delivering? Uh, can we recycle the food crates? Uh, can you work with me on not using black plastic packaging because that can't be you know, uh, recycled effectively and, and just knowing the right questions and, and sometimes just having zero tolerance. Like we're no longer taking in disposable plastics. So you're going to have to fix your supply chain or maybe we'll find someone else. You know, at certain stages, you can get quite hard line. Yeah. On, on calculating your carbon footprint, you know, you say you've been working. Are you working with a, a company 
to do that. All yes, right. and my business partner is here somewhere in the room. Right, you know, not listening, but somewhere where, and I can tell you on that because that's a that's the day to day detail, which is not my uh, forte. Yeah, yeah, fine. But yeah, we, we work with people to do that. Yeah, because there are people here, nutritics. Yeah, 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 there and, are lots of people doing and, it. Now. And I think that I, I think that is really a sign of the times. All of a sudden, those companies are coming in, and dare I say, they were working on the working out calories, and now they're giving up on that because carbon footprint really does chime with the with the public but again i would give them a hard time because i am so frustrated that the beef on our menu is grass-fed and it has the same really bad rating as a feedlot cow from the us so how can it be that they equate one beef one, yeah, yeah. one, one yeah. cow with so another it's them, yeah. so it's a really blunt tool at the moment so i would urge anyone who's doing this carbon thing to keep asking them yeah. why is it that my free-range chicken is the same rating as a battery chicken you know, we've got to ask those questions. Indeed, yeah. And I think that's absolutely right because, you know, the more you go into it, the more you learn. And that's what we need to do because yeah. the consumers understand. Yeah. A lot of them do. There was a question over here. Yeah. Hi, Tommy. Thank you. Hi. I really love your passion and really love the Oaxaca brand and everything you've put into it. Thanks. Um, my question to you is, what is your favorite thing about being co-founder at Oaxaca? And my favorite what? Favorite thing about it. Favorite thing about your job. I might About my job. Um, I think the people. I mean, our, our staff are just amazing um and i think one of my favorite things about hospitality is the fact you can take anyone from any background whether they've been in prison for murder or whether they've come from a broken home like my nephew who was scooped up by leo one of my chefs who's been with us for 12 years uh leo's from one of the favelas in northern um, brazil and when my nephew aged 15 which is basically not turning up at school uh leo just took him under his arm one summer holidays and turned his life around. And I just, I've seen that firsthand in so many cases, whether it's, you know, refugees coming in to England with absolutely no English um, and then seeing how hard they can yeah. work. And, and if you just give people an opportunity, I think we have to work really hard to also prove to kids who are very well educated that it's not just for scooping up people with, with no no, you know, no background or no training, that it's an amazing career for people with very good training and a very good educations. Because, you know, I really think in this business, you can pretty much shape your future by your enterprise, your ability to work hard, and also the way you treat your people. And I think, you know, uh, our sector is all about people. Yeah. And, and that is sometimes the worst side of it, but also the best side of it. And, you know, going into work and working with our teams honestly gives me so much joy. Yeah, I mean, let's let's look at Oaxaca. I mean, from those early days, it, it created off of your 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 famous famous uh, trip and and time spent in Mexico, um, you know, creating the concept. How much is how much has it changed over the years? Not just obviously, it's grown in terms of a, you know, you, you are you are now part of the restaurant establishment, <laughs> whether you like it or not. But but how, how has it grown and how? Uh, Perhaps in a sense of how, how you feel it has grown. Is it grown in the right way? Well, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting whenever you start any business, there's that kind of initial kind of rush when you're like the, that real entrepreneur spirit yeah. where you're, you're kind of where, you know, working on empty, you know, crazy hours, just kind of doing everything to grow and also kind of finding your market, knowing your customer, learning the hard way, making yeah. umpteen mistakes. And then there's that bit of your journey when you start, you're no longer the smallest player and you kind of expand a bit. And that real kind of danger point when you're growing from small to kind of medium, say, and how hard it is growing a company successfully. You know, we definitely struggled as we open more restaurants to keep quality, yeah. keep our staff engaged and also just keep a business focus. Because I think when you're an entrepreneur, you are creative you're energized by looking at what's going on and you tend to get distracted yeah. by fun innovations. And it's sometimes it's quite hard to keep, you know, your main thing, the main thing. Yeah. So it's learning growing up as, as it were and, and learning to kind of, you've got to keep, keep, keep your main thing, the main thing whilst also letting innovation still come in, but not going too off path, which we, we did definitely do it from time to time. Um, and now, you know, now it feels as if we're kind of, what are we in our, <laughs> we're definitely not, we're definitely not the toddlers, we're definitely not adolescents. I kind of think we're in our grand 
old age, but that was still nimble. I feel like, yeah, yeah. you know, is it that the 50s are the new 40s or the 40s new 30s? I mean, I'm in my mid 40s. I feel still like my, I'm in my mid 20s. Although not when I'm next to a mid 20 year old, but like in my head, I'm still really young. You should worry. So then, you know, I think, um, I think as a business, and I think that's why the sustainability piece is so important. Yeah. I mean, look at BT. BT was this immensely powerful business that controlled, you know, was, was part of our DNA in this country and it kind of died a death. So I think no matter what stage you are in your entrepreneurship and your business owning, you've got to stay with it. And, and, it's, it's, and it's exciting. And, and that's why I also love about going into work is that I'm basically one of the older people in the backer. And, you know, you learn so much from the people around you. Yeah. And that's how you stay relevant and current. So, that's great. yeah. Any, any more questions before we wrap it up? No, Grace is going. So, okay. So, as we, we started the conversations about all the other things you do. So, obviously, you know, you, you, you write, you do media. I'm interested to see what you're picking up perhaps from, from those, those avenues of your life, which is coming back in, into Oaxaca, particularly in terms of your sense of where, where, the, where the public is and what, what they're, they're after when they, they go out to eat and drink. Well, I think they are, I mean, the Kerry survey was really fascinating. I think, um, I think the consumer is particularly the young. You know, there is so much anxiety about the young, not helped by COVID. Yeah. Um, there's a proper anxiety. And I think they really want to know that businesses are, are walking the walk, not just talking about yeah. it. And I think, um, you know, green, you greenwash out your own peril because we also can see that because of social media, there is a zero tolerance. You know, I think this kind of thing of cancelling people, cancelling companies is, is not great. And I think, you know, we're all trying to do the same thing. No yep. one wants the planet to burn. Um, and I think basically every human being, no matter where they come from or their religious creeds or political creeds, basically are all in the same, same trajectory of what they want from the, from the world. You know, safety, a family, a happy planet. Um, so I think, but, but it is very important to the consumer. And I think, so you have to, you have to make sure whatever you are doing is the right thing that it, it that it chimes with your brand. Cause I yeah. think it's got to work with your brand, That it's not didactic. I mean, no one wants to be lectured when they're going out to eat. And that's the kind of, I think that's the tricky it's thing a too. Act, yeah. It's a balancing act because people want to escape, you know, they go out to eat to escape from their daily worries and have fun and have some delicious food and be with their loved ones and some friends and family. So it's got to be fun. It's got to be delicious. It's got to chime with your brand. Um, and then hopefully you can talk about it in a fun way because it's going to cost you something. I mean, in some ways, going for a greener future of your business will save you, hopefully, gas and electricity yeah. if you're being savvy about saving energy. Um, but some of it will cost more, like the composting. Uh, so make sure you're actually communicating that to your customers so they know that you're going to bother doing it, yeah. but do it in the right way so then they don't feel they're being lectured. Yeah, and I think that communication is absolutely key. Keep talking. Uh, and we could do all day, but yeah. Tommy Myers, that was a fantastic half hour. Oh. Thank you very much for your time. Thank Ladies you. gentlemen, Tommy Myers. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you in conjunction with The Casual Dining Show. The Peach Podcast is always free to listen to. To find us, search Peach 2020, the top table on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or in any app that supports podcasts. All our podcasts will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Now, don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe to make sure you don't miss our future episodes. Podcast from Peach 2020, hosted by Peter Martin.